Um, you know we've been doing the little orange books um, through Lent. Well, Judy's going to say a little bit about what it's meant to her this week. So I've just done a little reflection on Tuesday's Lenten study. On Tuesday this week, in our Lenten study guide, the reflection was entitled, Get Into Training. The Bible reading was from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 to 14. And it's about solid food solid food being for the mature and is for those who've been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. Solid food refers to our capacity to feast on a deeper knowledge of God. It occurred to me that in order to grow and develop maturity with regard to my faith, I ought to be more prepared to evaluate my spiritual journey by looking at the choices I make in the light of God's word. In order to do that, I need to become more in tune with the heart of God and not to be too hard on myself if I don't understand something straight away when studying the scriptures. But instead, I should should really persevere more by reading more and asking more questions and cross-referencing until I develop a greater understanding. All too often, it's easy for us to want to taste God's banquet before we are spiritually capable of digesting it. As we grow in our Christian faith, It is then, and only then, that we're able to put into practice the truths that we've learnt and our capacity to understand will grow. So finally, I think God may have been prompting me to become more discerning when reading his word by calling on the Holy Spirit to enlighten me as I read and to become more proactive in response to what I've read, as opposed to being passive and accepting of the views of others. As we draw close to God, I believe he will draw close to us and again begin to transform us into the people that he wants us to be. Thank you, Judith. It's almost as if you've read my sermon before we've even started. (laughs) It's good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the work of your hands, How great are your words, O Lord, how profound your thoughts. So let's confirm the psalmist's words as we come. Come, now is the time to worship.
Father God, we have come to worship you, to praise you. Sometimes if we've had a difficult week, it's hard to switch our thoughts from our troubles to focus on you. Help us, Lord, for you are the creator of all things, and yet you want to spend time with us. That's such an awesome thing to think about. Thank you. Thank you for loving us so much you sent Jesus to lead us into your presence. To teach us that we can call you Abba, Father. Through Jesus you teach us about love and compassion, forgiveness and redemption. Thank you that through this time of Lent we can learn even more about your very nature and we want to learn more. We ask for forgiveness for the times we got things wrong and help us to forgive others when we've been affected by something they have done. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, so that he can remind us of all you teach us day by day, moment by moment. You are our precious Lord, Saviour, and Redeemer. And we pray to you in the name of Jesus to bring you glory. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we're going to get ready to listen to scripture now, but first we're going to sing Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. are going to come.
The first reading is taken from the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 35, 1 to 6, and 10 to 16. Josiah celebrated the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem, and the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the first month. He appointed the priests to their duties and encouraged them in the service of the Lord's temple. He said to the Levites who instructed all Israel, he said to the Levites who instructed all Israel and who had been consecrated to the Lord, put the sacred ark in the temple that Solomon, son of David, king of Israel built. It is not to be carried about on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. Prepare yourselves by families in your divisions according to the instructions written by David, king of Israel, and by his son Solomon. Stand in the holy place with a group of Levites for each subdivision of the families of your fellow Israelites, the lay people. Slaughter the Passover lambs, consecrate yourselves and prepare the lambs for your fellow Israelites, <coughs> doing what the Lord commanded through, Rose, through Moses. The service was arranged and the priests stood in their places with the Levites in their divisions as the king had ordered. The Passover lambs were slaughtered and the priests slashed against the altar the blood handed to them while the Levites skinned the animals. They set aside the burnt offerings to give them to the subdivisions of the families of the people to offer to the Lord. As it is written in the book of Moses, they did the same with the cattle. They roasted the Passover animals over the fire as prescribed and boiled the holy offerings in pots, cauldrons and pans and served them quickly to all the people. After this, they made preparations for themselves and for the priests because the priests, the descendants of Aaron, were sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fat portions until nightfall. So the Levites made preparations for themselves and for the Aaronic priests. The musicians, the descendants of Asaph, were in the places prescribed by David, Asaph, Heman and Jeduthun, the king's seer. The gatekeepers at each gate did not need to leave their posts because their fellow Levites made the preparations for them. So at that time, the entire service of the Lord was carried out for the celebration of the Passover and the offering of burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord, as King Josiah had ordered. May God bless this portion of his word. Our second reading today is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, commencing at verse 1 to 13. Now the feast of the unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go, make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. 
Thanks be to God for his word. Thank you. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a king. And his name was Josiah. Who was Josiah? What was his background? The people have been living a sort of seesaw kind of existence for many years. And Josiah's ancestors were renowned for being either very good or very bad. A very good leader or a very bad leader. And if we were to start with King Ahaz, we are told he was not a good king. He worshipped idols and built altars, altars to all kinds of gods. However, his son, Hezekiah, listened to the temple priests and made the decision that all the idols should go and the people should worship Yahweh, the one true God. So he destroyed all the, altars in the t idols in the temple and everywhere else they were to be found and called the people to turn their backs on their false <coughs> gods who were no gods at all. Hezekiah demonstrated his trust in God when Judah came under attack from the Assyrians. Now, you would have thought that seeing these things as he grew up, Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, would have continued to worship God in the temple. But no, Manasseh worshipped idols and had idols erected in God's temple and all the places that Hezekiah had destroyed them. But there was a twist to this story because Manasseh was imprisoned later on by the Assyrians and they were a cruel and ruthless people. And while he was in prison, he began to remember what his father had taught him about Yahweh, had taught him about God. And Manasseh called on God and repented. When the Assyrians allowed Manasseh to go back home, he did as Hezekiah had done and destroyed all the false idols in the temple and all the other places. And he re-established, rededicated the temple as a place of worship to the one true God. There's another twist. When Manasseh's son Amon became king, he decided to bring back the idols. Now you can see what I mean about a seesaw existence. So all the idols got built up again and everybody started to worship and bring shame to God's temple. Then came Amon's son and this is Josiah. Now he was only about eight years old when he became king. <coughs> And we're told that he began to seek the Lord and he worked hard to re-establish the temple. And it was while this work was being done that the lost and forgotten Torah, the book of the law, was found. And when it was read to Josiah, he listened to the descriptions of God's spiritual and moral standards and saw immediately how far the Hebrew people had strayed from God's ways. And he was horrified. He tore his clothes as a sign of his grief and he told the high priest to pray for the nation because surely such disobedience would bring God's anger. Because Josiah didn't know what to do to make things right, the priests consulted a respected prophetess now, we don't hear much about female prophets, do we? But this was a special one, Huldah, who confirmed that Judah would indeed be destroyed as a punishment, but not during Josiah's lifetime. 
So what did Josiah do? Well, he didn't throw up his hands and say, well, I might as well not bother then. If it's going to be destroyed anyway, there's nothing we can do. He didn't do that. He called the people together. Everyone from the highest priest to the lowliest laborers to listen to God's commandments. And to emphasize their importance, he read the words himself to the people. And he made public the promise to keep God's decrees. This public reading of the law began an era of radical reform. Josiah cleansed the temple of all those things that had been connected with the worship of Baal and Asherah or any of the other idols, and he had them burned. Altars that had been raised to worship idols throughout the land were destroyed. The finding of God's word had a life-changing effect on Josiah, and he realised that the people had never kept the Passover had forgotten all about this special festival. And so he commanded all the preparations we read about this morning. This celebration revived not only the religious tradition of recalling God's rescue of the Hebrews from the Egyptians, but also their ancient identity as a nation set apart by God. This man... This king was so excited, so impressed by the reading of God's word that he changed. And because he changed, the nation changed. The priests, the prophets, the people were reminded who they were in God's eyes. For so long they had gone their own way, no longer recognising that the things they did were actually the wrong things. The gods they worshipped were wrong in God's eyes. They had forgotten that they needed to come to God for forgiveness. Even some of the Hebrew priests had been guilty of making offerings to Baal. But now they were being led by a faithful man who read God's word aloud to them. When you read this story, you can sense an excitement, a commitment, a sense of purpose, a joy that at last here was something Josiah could do to demonstrate to God that he was indeed a faithful servant to the living God, grateful for his position as king over the Hebrew people and wanting the whole nation to see who God is and how to worship him with thanksgiving. In the second book of Kings, we can read this about Josiah. Neither before or after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength, in accordance with all of the law of Moses. How wonderful to have these words written about you in scripture for all to see and to be a witness to. Our reading from Luke gives us the story of a completely different set of circumstances leading to the preparation of the Passover feast. And it begins with Judas Iscariot, described as one of the twelve. It's been said before how sad it is that an ordinary name has become throughout history to be associated with betrayal. Even to the point when people will say something like, you Judas, when they feel they've been betrayed. Throughout the Gospels, we gain a picture of this man that is far from flattering. Have you ever wondered how he came to be one of the twelve. According to what we read, his nature seems so different to the other disciples. This particular time, Judas has visited the chief priests and officers of the temple to discuss with them how he might 
betray Jesus. How often have we asked ourselves the question, why? What did he hope to gain? Was it the money? Did he think he could push or manipulate Jesus into becoming the man that Judas wanted him to be? Did he want Jesus to be a warrior, a king sweeping down into the town to rescue the Jews from their Roman overlords? He'd seen what an influence Jesus had among the people. Perhaps he could use this to his own advantage. Maybe we'll never know. I suspect that the reason we feel this way about Judas is because of what the betrayal meant to our Saviour and Lord, this, this lovely, wonderful person that we have come to love. And it all happened as the time for the Passover approaches. So from both readings, we're looking at preparations for the Passover festival. Josiah is careful with the detail because of his love and respect for the Lord God. Where Judas appears to approach the time with more for an eye to manipulation, thinking perhaps at the time as one of opportunity rather than thanksgiving and worship. And that brings us to us. Um, we're now best part of the way through the time of Lent. Have we viewed this time as being any different to the many other times of worship and study? Have we gained anything? Have we changed any of our attitudes because of something we've read or heard? Have we spent extra time in prayer and reading our Bibles or thought-provoking books? Or have we just let the time drift by. How should we spend or view the rest of this time of Lent? If it is a time of preparation, what are we preparing for? And how should we prepare? I'm not going to give you definitive answers, but I am suggesting we look at the two examples the scriptures have given us today and decide whose witness we could or maybe should follow. Josiah was excited and took pleasure in reading God's word. He read it aloud to the people and he encouraged others into giving thanks and praise and worship to God. Not only did Josiah change, but the nation changed because of his desire to please honour and worship Yahweh. He learned from mistakes and lived a totally different kind of life. Judas allowed himself to be used, manipulated, and didn't appear to have thanksgiving and worship in the forefront of his mind. What he wanted led him to turn from God betraying our saviour to those who wanted to maintain what power they had achieved. I believe God is challenging us today. I think he wants us to think seriously about who we are, who he is, and what the relationship is between us. Lent is a time of preparation leading up to the celebrations of Easter. But it also gives us the opportunity to prepare for tomorrow, an hour's time, the next moment. And this is eternally essential. Josiah's witness brought the people of Judah to God's presence. What did Judas's witness do? What will our witness do? Something to think about. Something to pray about. Do we humble ourselves before God or do we think we have better things to do? 
Do we worship only God? Or do things become our idols? Lent. A time of preparation. May the Lord guide us. Amen. Up you get, Ros. Time to sing. <laughs> We're going to sing, I want to serve the purpose of God. anticlimax that finish it feels as if it ought to have something extra doesn't it <laughs> now our time of prayers of intercession let us pray when we read scripture we learn that we are to pray for the world world leaders the church and each other because that pleases god Father, we are troubled when we listen to the news, see and hear of all the dreadful things that drought, floods, earthquakes and war bring. 
Life is such a beautiful gift. Our world is such a beautiful gift. May our witness bring about change. Change because people learn about you through our lives. May how we live draw people to want to know the truth, that you are God, the one and only God, and you love them. We pray for the leaders of the world dealing with such big issues. Ukraine, Russia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Pakistan, and so many other countries, Lord, where people are suffering. Father, we pray for the sick, for those who care for them. We thank you that we can be sure that you are alongside each and every one without fail, and for that we are truly grateful. We pray for those who are sad today because the one they love has died. They're safe with you, but the, the one left behind feels bereft and desperately lonely. Father, give to them that peace which passes all understanding and touch them now, even as we pray. Father, we pray for your church, the worldwide body of people with Christ as their head. Forgive us when we don't agree, when we cause division. Join us together in unity and love. Help us all to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you and never lose the desire to know more of you and of your will for us. May we always look to comfort others stand for justice and support those who are too weak to speak for themselves. We praise and thank you for all you have done to ensure salvation for us all. All these prayers we offer you in and through the name of Jesus that your name will be glorified. Amen. And we close with, God has spoken by his prophets. <laughs>
Father God, we thank you for the fellowship we've shared today. Bless us as we go out in your name. May we live and work to your praise and glory. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.